Hey everybody, it's Jeannie and James from EMS Training here with Captain Zavok from QAQI. Today we're going to talk about ways to protect yourself while doing both non-invasive and invasive airway management during the COVID-19 pandemic. As per IMS guidance and our medical director, aerosol generating procedures should be avoided unless the patient presents in severe respiratory distress. This means if the patient presents with the inability to speak between breaths, increased number of breaths per minute, diaphoresis, accessory muscle use, cyanosis, and respiratory arrest. Supplemental oxygen should be administered to any PUI with a pulse ox less than 94%. If oxygen is administered, the patient's pulse ox should be maintained no higher than 96%. If you refer to this document here directly from MIMS website, uh, you can see that anytime we're performing an aerosol generating procedure or treating a patient in cardiac arrest, the minimum PPE that we should have on is gloves, eye protection, and an N95 respirator. We should also be wearing a gown. Some of the key points just to mention here are that we do not want you to turn on oxygen prior to placing a device on the patient and prior to having a surgical mask in place. We also don't want you to remove the oxygen delivery device before first turning off the O2. Captain Savat, can you start us off with some non-invasive airway procedures? Sure, Jeannie. So we have to kind of change our basics just a little bit here um, and, and really break down the procedure. Um, going back to initial training, obviously, is going to tell you that you're going to turn on your device and get your leader flow and everything set and apply the oxygen to the patient. Um, but we're really trying to avoid this. We want to make sure to focus on um, protecting the patient from us and us from the patient. So what we're going to do first is um, apply the device, either nasal cannula or non breather mask, followed by a surgical mask in place over top of those devices, then go ahead and turn the oxygen on, whether it be from your portable oxygen cylinder or from your onboard oxygen. Uh, set your liter flow as you normally would, two to six liters per minute, obviously nasal cannula, 10 to 15 non rebreather mask. Again, keeping in mind that surgical mask needs to be in place before turning the oxygen on. Um, when you go to transfer the patient in the hospital, make sure that you are turning the oxygen off prior to doing so. In, um, in addition, if you have to do any kind of procedure and any kind of medication, if patient's having chest pain, you have to give nitro or aspirin, uh, you may want to consider dc the oxygen momentarily, lifting the surgical mask off, giving that medication, pushing the, putting the mask back down, putting the surgical mask back in place, covering the, both the bridge of the nose and the mouth, and then turning the oxygen back on. Again, a little break from the normal what we're doing, but these um, times are certainly different for us, and adaptation is key. Absolutely. Thanks, Cap. Now, James, can you give us some information on CPAP? Absolutely. So some of the things that we need the clinicians in the field to know about CPAP is that this is a serious risk of aerosolizing COVID-19. So anytime you're CPAP in a patient, you always need to wear your PPE. Minimize the personnel involved in those procedures. So anytime, you're per, anytime that you are doing an airway procedure, make sure that you minimize the exposure. So only use the personnel that you need to get that procedure done. And then think about maximizing your ventilation. So if you're in a house, open up a door or window. If you're in a transport unit, open up the side door or the rear door and make sure that the ventilation fans are on. So those are some safety precautions anytime that you're managing an airway. But when it comes to the CPAP device, I think it's important to understand that it has unprotected exhaust ports. And the best thing that we were able to come up with at EMS training for the clinicians to kind of protect themselves is to wrap the exhaust ports with cling and secure it with oxygen tubing. And we're gonna show you a video of that here in a second. Next, anytime that you're managing somebody's airway, especially with CPAP, we would like you to cover that patient with a sheet, a blanket, or even a piece of plastic. One of the things that you'll see here in the next couple of days is we're, uh, EMS training will be rolling out a video showing how to use a poncho to protect yourself when providing airway management. Uh, I do believe, Joe, you can speak on that. I believe QAQI has ordered uh, several of them. They're going to be coming out to the transport units so that, again, we can get some type of droplet protection anytime we're managing an airway. Um, finally, when we talk about placement and discontinuation of CPAP, 
please understand that anytime that you place CPAP on a patient, you need to turn the oxygen, you need to apply the mask first and then turn on the oxygen. When you go to discontinue that, you need to turn the oxygen off first and then remove the mask from the patient. And you're gonna be asked to do that anytime that you transport that patient to a hospital. Anytime before you enter the hospital, they're gonna have you discontinue CPAP. So if you wanna roll that video, Gene. So if you see here in the video, on the side of the circuit is where you can see the exhaust ports, and then on the end of the circuit, you can also see the exhaust port. So you can see we're not able to put a HEPA filter or a rapid N95 or a surgical mask or anything easily around this. So what we came up with in EMS training for droplet protection only is that you can wrap this with some cling, secure it in place with a piece of tape, and then you'll see that they'll turn the circuit around and you need to tuck the ends of the cling into the forward part of the exhaust ports and then kind of hold it in place with the oxygen tubing. And again, this is not 100%, but this does provide some type of droplet protection. It is something that we can do to potentially limit an exposure. Absolutely, thanks James. Now Captain Samak, can you tell us what we could, should consider when administering NEB treatments? Sure. So again, as we look at our uh, application of aerosolizing devices, Jimmy just talked about CPAP here, and uh, he's going to cover innovation in just a few seconds. Looking at nebulizers, uh, again, aerosolizing off uh, from the patient's expiration, uh, exhalation, excuse me. Uh, as we look at setting the device up back to the basics, we want to make sure that the device is set up. We have seen uh, some practices around the country where they are taking electrodes, placing them on the exhaust ports of the mask to decrease the amount of aerosolization taking place um, out into the atmosphere, out into the environment, making sure that the medication chamber is filled, is attached to the mask, is then applied to the patient. The surgical mask on the outside of that first and then the oxygen started. Again, we can't stress this enough. Um, it's a break from the norm. We thoroughly understand the device needs to be in place first, surgical mask on the outside of that, then the oxygen goes on let the nebulizer treatment go as needed. And then once we arrive at the ER, if the nebulizer treatment has not finished, the clinician has a couple of op op options. Obviously, uh, we're not going to abandon the patient. The primary clinician should stay with the um, patient, but they can open the back doors, they can step down the wheel well to try and distance themselves from the patient while that nebulizer treatment continues. If the patient starts to deteriorate and rapid uh, transport into the ER is required, then that uh, nebulizer treatment really needs to be discontinued prior to leaving the ambulance. Oxygen should be turned off at that point in time, or at least the nebulizer itself removed, um, again, prior to leaving the ambulance. So break from the norm, mask with the medication ready to go, surgical mask on the outside of that, apply them to the patient, and then go ahead and turn the oxygen on. Jimmy? So yeah, Joe, one of the things that I think is important Dr. Wendell was discussing about before was if you have a patient that you feel needs the nebulizer, they're in severe respiratory stress, they need a neb treatment. He had made mention about getting that patient outside and performing that procedure outside in a parking lot or in the front yard of the house or whatever, just getting outside, making it a safer environment. Absolutely. And Cap, the only other thing I wanted to, to just touch on here was the use of a patient's MDI with a spacer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So again, going back to basics, if the patient has the medication already, the MDI spacer is going to help hold that medication and decrease the amount of environmental aerosolization of the medication. So the patient can uh, take two puffs into the chamber or their prescribed dose um, and breathe off of that. I understand at this point in time, obviously the patient is going to be exposed. They're not going to have that surgical mask in place, but this decreases the overall aerosolization of the medication and exhalation. So again, just some things to consider, some treatments that are probably outside the norm for most of us. Um, using a patient's MDI with a spacer is appropriate, um, even bringing it to the hospital if necessary, uh, making sure that you have a good uh, plan moving forward there for that. Give them the medication surgical mask back in place, or if you are transferring over to a NEB mask, that the mask and the surgical mask are in place as well. Great, thank you. 
Okay, so we've covered non-invasive airway management procedures. Let's now talk about invasive airway management procedures. James, can you fill us in on that? Absolutely. So when it comes to invasive airway procedures, back to, again, let's start off with the safety precautions. It's high risk of aerosolizing COVID-19. So always wear your proper PPE. Again, minimize the personnel that are involved in those procedures. Maximize your ventilation and at all costs, try to cover the patient during the procedure. Again, a sheet, a blanket, or a piece of plastic like the poncho that we're gonna roll out here shortly. Always have a suction plan anytime you're managing a COVID-19 patient's airway. The patient vomiting, it creates a, a pretty severe exposure risk. So we would like you to get that under control as fast as possible. So making sure that you have a suction unit, you have the catheters, you have the suction tips, everything that you need to be able to take care of that emergency is, is very important. So make sure you have a good solid suction plan. If you're a BLS provider and you're managing the airway with BLS means, make sure that you have good two thumbs down technique. If not, then a good solid CE, but whatever one you're using, you have to have a good mask seal. You don't want any leak, air leakage. You don't want any COVID-19 being aerosolized into the environment around you. And use the HEPA filter. When it comes to the supraglottic airway, if you look down at the three bottom bullets on the form that's a, a guidance from MIMS, it says if you need for advanced airway arises, the EMS condition should utilize a supraglottic airway whenever possible. And that is to minimize the risk of exposure to the clinicians that are there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to understand that anytime that you are using a supraglottic airway that we need to decompress the stomach, put a gastric tube down the gastric channel of that supraglottic airway, or for us, the king airway, so that you can de that you can decompress the belly and keep that exposure of vomit from coming back at the clinicians. Also understand that a supraglottic airway is not 100%, that if it doesn't fit correctly, if the anatomy of the patient doesn't fit the, the device, or if the patient moves and the seal is broken, you can get a lot of blowback and that could also create aerosolizing of COVID-19. So if you run into that problem, it says if endotracheal intubation is required, the EMS clinician should be the most experienced at airway management. So again, using your most experienced clinician so that we can be successful, first time success with this. It also recommends that video laryngoscopy should be utilized whenever available. So when you move down into direct laryngoscopy, so your supraglottic airway is not working for you and you need to work into direct laryngoscopy, we want you to use video laryngoscopy to minimize the exposure risk. It gets you further away from the patient's airway. We want you to maximize the first time success. That means have your equipment set up, have it ready to go, have your tube holder in place, have your bougie pre-threaded in your ET tube, have everything out ready to go. And then minimize your attempts. Again, by maximizing your first time success, hopefully you won't have any more than one attempt at the airway management. But again, we want you to minimize your attempts. When um, dealing with the airway, again, just make sure that you take all precautions. It's a high risk of aerosolizing and all of these procedures are just, again, um, things that you can do to minimize that risk to you and the people that you're working with. Joe, you think anything you can add? No, I think, you know, here we are the first week in April coming out with these different tips and tricks, uh, kind of learned uh, nationwide and best practices. Things are going to evolve uh, even faster. And, and I know that we're getting ready to roll out you know, email addresses here in just a few seconds. But again, for any, everybody watching, if you have any ideas, any suggestions, things that you've seen and read about in recent days and weeks, please don't hesitate to bring them forward. It takes a little bit of time for uh, training to go through and do the research on to make sure that they're legit. Um, there are a lot of great ideas that have been coming in, and I think over the next couple of days and weeks even, we'll see a lot of changes out there in the field. Yeah, Dr. Wendell's been very adamant about making sure that we let everybody know that this is changing daily, hourly, down to the minute, and this is the latest, greatest patient practice information as of April the 3rd that we can provide, but moving forward as this epidemic or this pandemic, sorry, as this pandemic evolves and we start learning more, we're going to learn more tips and tricks and this information may change. So as a result, we're going to continue these types of delivery methods for things, for this information to get out to everybody. So yeah, absolutely agree with you, Joe. Yeah. Thanks guys.
We want to remind everybody that our job in EMS training is to look at all of the research, current COVID-19 trends, and best patient care practices. Our goal is to provide you, the clinicians in the field that are treating the COVID-19 patients, with the best practices for keeping yourself safe while treating your patients. An email address has been created for all of your patient care questions. It's askems at aacounty.org. Um, again, this email will be reviewed by QAQI, EMS Training, and Dr. Wendell. We will uh, review and answer all of your patient care questions during the best practice updates. EMS Training has already received multiple patient care questions, and here now to address them is Dr. Wendell. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me on. Before we start, I, I feel the need to put it in a caveat statement. Um, we're learning more and more about this disease every day. So my answers to your questions reflect the best guidance that I can provide at this time, which is April 3rd, 2020. So realize information is changing and uh, we will adapt um, as new information comes in. Great, thanks doc. So the question number one is if a patient is wheezing, but we do not feel that they're bad enough to risk administering a nebulizer, should we administer epi in place of the neb? Uh, great question. So the answer is it depends. So remember that epinephrine for um, respiratory distress in the MIMS protocol is for severe respiratory distress only. So in general, if you think they're stable enough that you can withhold albuterol, then they're probably stable enough that you can withhold epi too. If you're concerned because of their history or because of something else in their presentation that they may deteriorate, um, if you don't give any treatment, then it's perfectly acceptable to treat them with intramuscular epinephrine. Just remember, use caution in anybody who has a cardiac history or who is older. Um, also remember that if you think a nebulizer is necessary, you should probably do it in some sort of um, way that you're risking exposure to yourself and your fellow clinicians. So take them out to the front porch and do it in open air, or at least open the back doors to the unit so that you have air flow through and you're decreasing your aerosolization. If you decide to do it, also put a surgical mask over the top of it just for some source control. Great, thank you. So another question that we got, Doc, was that there's been a lot of talk about steroids having a negative effect on COVID-19 patients. Should we as, with, as clinicians withhold administering steroids to a suspected COVID-19 patient? So I have to tell you, this is a little bit controversial. So the World Health Organization and the CDC still recommend, or, um, recommend that steroids are not used for COVID-19 pneumonia and ARDS. Uh, because they have shown very little benefit and the potential for harm. However, um, there is still some leeway when patients have underlying respiratory conditions like asthma or COPD. There's still a recommendation for those patients, if you think this is more of a reactive airway problem, to, to, to uh, still administer steroids. Um, Remember that steroids don't work right away. It'll take at least an hour for steroids to take effect, so you're unlikely to see any sort of change or benefit during your transport times. And if you're to the point where you're thinking, hey, I should give this patient maybe some steroids, you should also consider other treatments like magnesium sulfate. All right, thank you. Uh, you got one, Joe? I do. Uh, right now here it says, when I arrived at the hospital today, they made me turn off my O2 and remove CPAP. Uh, why is that? Um, no, they told you to turn off your oxygen and your CPAP because transmission for COVID-19 is mainly from respiratory droplets. And anything that we're doing that introduces um, pressure into the airway has the potential for aerosolizing these respiratory droplets. Um, when you aerosolize a droplet, it, makes, it means you make this um, into tiny little particles that are small enough that can re potentially remain in the air for an extended amount of time. Some studies have shown it can remain in the air up to three hours. They can also travel further distances and can be inhaled, which is how uh, the infection is transmitted. So out of an abundance of caution, the hospitals want you to stop anything that may potentially generate aerosol procedures uh, before you push through the hospital hallways and, and infect other people. Perfect, thanks. So the next question is, do I need to sign in and out of each patient's room when I transfer care to the hospital? 
this is going to be a hospital by hospital thing. So some hospitals have a sheet on the doorway that um, has anybody who enters the room sign on there. What this does is it's a tracking mechanism. So if the patient ends up positive for COVID-19, they know who has been potentially exposed to them. Hospitals are using other methods of tracking patients too, especially patients who are brought in by EMS. So it's not absolutely essential that you do it, but it is a good practice because it dramatically reduces um, the work required to find who's been in the room. Um, and it just gives you that extra layer of protection to know uh, you'll be contacted if, if we have a, an exposure. Great. All right, doc, so we got another question and it is, is it acceptable to cover the patient to minimize aerosolization of droplets when applying CPAP or performing invasive airway management? Absolutely, and I think this is actually a best practice and something that um, we're working on uh, formalizing another method. So uh, we have received clear plastic ponchos and we're working on the training aspect to get them pushed out to the field, i.e. Jimmy, Jeannie, mm -hmm. Congratulations, we have more work. Um, what we're going to do is anytime airway maneuvers are done, we're gonna have the head covered um, to potentially decrease aerosolization of particles or release of those aerosolized particles um, into the environment. So um, this training is coming, just be on the lookout for that training. In the meantime, um, you can always just cover the patient up with a blanket or a sheet. I see very little harm in it and potential benefit um, if the patient can tolerate it, just decreasing any sort of aerosolization um, around you. All right. Great. And Doc, the next question kind of rolls right into that then when we talk about some of our more aggressive airway management, um, specifically managing the airway of a cardiac arrest patient. What are your recommendations? <laughs> this is a tough one. So, First and foremost, like any cardiac arrest, you need to protect yourselves. Uh, it's always your safety first, then the patient. So um, I just got off a very long phone call with the other medical directors around the state. And I know on the national level, um, there is no specific consensus on the single best way to do this. So what I'm going to give you is just some advice on, on different, um, different methods. And the EMS clinician on scene is going to have to make the best assessment and decide what is the best way to approach the, manage, uh, or approach the management of the airway that is directly in front of them. So I already talked about the plastic sheet that's coming. So a best practice would be to keep that patient covered, at least the head and the airway covered when you're performing any airway management. Um, this decreases, like I said before, the release of those aerosolized particles. Um, we have HEPA filters. So it's very, very important that anytime we're doing some sort of positive pressure ventilation, either with a bag valve mask or with um, through an endotracheal tube or an alternative airway that we use that HEPA filter. That decreases the release of particles back um, when the patient exhales. As far as cardiac management, uh, or excuse me, cardiac arrest airway management itself, uh, the first thing we think about is called passive oxygenation. This is a technique that's used all around the world. It's gaining steam for all cardiac arrest management. And essentially it is you just put either a nasal cannula or what we would rather you do, a non-rebreather over the patient's nose and mouth immediately and then cover that up with a face mask. During the process of CPR, there is air exchange back and forth just with normal CPR. So putting a passive oxygen on the patient's mouth, believe it or not, moves air um, during the process of CPR. More traditionally, <clears throat> we use a bag valve mask. Uh, bag valve mask is a high risk thing for our clinicians because if, if you do not obtain a good seal, you have the potential of push, pushing these aerosolized droplets out of the side of the, of the mask. So really important that you get a good seal. Uh, recommend at least two clinicians on the airway with a bag valve mask. That's one clinician doing a two hand um, thumbs down grip seal of the face and the other one doing gentle bagging. You get too aggressive, air leaks out the side, aerosolization and exposure. Make sure you have that HEPA filter between the mask and the uh, bag. If you need to go to a more advanced airway technique, 
um, a lot of people are going straight to supraglottic airways. If you go to our King airway, which is a supraglottic airway, um, it can be deployed rapidly. Um, and if it seats properly, it can uh, provide pretty good uh, ventilation um, with minimal um, leakage of aerosolized particles. The problem is the King airway doesn't seat properly on everybody. So there is a risk for, for leakage of these aerosolized particles using, using the supraglottic airways. Just keep that in mind. If endotracheal intubation is required, you should do it in a manner that you decrease your exposure. So um, the EMS clinician with the most airway experience, this is the time for them to be doing the intubation. This is not the time where you wanna be doing this as a teaching airway. You wanna minimize the number of attempts, minimize the time that you're in the mouth. Um, just remember, endotracheal intubation has the highest risk for aerosolization of all the things that we do. If you're going to intubate, um, consider using the video laryngoscope. So using our UE scope, it allows the clinician to be the furthest away from the source of infection as possible. Um, and again, you can do all of this um, under that plastic sheeting to decrease exposure to your fellow clinicians. Great, that kind of takes us to our next question. We are being told to use the HEPA filter with inline capnography. However, can we still use nasal capnography? The short answer is yes. So you, you have to understand there's no formal studies on any of this as it relates to coronavirus. Um, but uh, our device reps at Medtronic uh, are telling us that the filter for the microscreen capnography is rated to 0 0.2 microns. Um, for perspective, our N95 masks are rated to 0 0.3 microns. So in theory, the capnography filter is smaller than um, the filter for our mask. Any other questions? No. All right now. No, I think that, that answers. I know I've got a couple phone calls about that, making sure that they can still use a nasal prong capnography. So knowing that they can is a good thing. Perfect. Well, keep sending your medical questions I, um, to the email that's provided. Um, I am here and more than happy to answer your questions as they come in. I think we should do this at least once a week. Um, you guys are all doing an awesome job. So thank you for your hard work. And I'm proud to work with all of you. So stay safe out there. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Thank you.